Good morning. You know, that, that, yes, we can give the Lord a round of applause, absolutely. Amen. You know, and, and that's why we're here. You know, I felt like that video really captured that, you know, as, as, as we move into the Christmas season. We have four Sundays um, leading up to uh, Christmas, four, four Sundays in the month of, of December. And then we come to our Christmas Eve service. Our Christmas Eve service is on a Monday this year. The 23rd is that, that fourth Sunday of December. Then we come back on Monday. And so I think I shared this last week, and you've probably seen it, a little bit of a time change with our Christmas Eve services. We're doing three, but we went a little bit earlier. So we're doing two, three, thirty, and five. And so three services there. Each service will be about 45 minutes, and we'll gather with our families and just celebrate uh, the true meaning of, of Christmas. Our angel tree is a huge ministry here. I'm sure you've seen our Christmas trees in our lobbies. Uh, this is a great ministry, to uh, an opportunity to be a blessing to families uh, within our church, but also families outside of our church. And so this is the last Sunday to grab a card. And so in all three services, I'm going to put this challenge out. In both lobbies, you'll find the angel tree. What we're asking you to do is take the card, purchase the item, and then bring it back unwrapped as a key part of this. Bring it back unwrapped <clears throat> to the office, and then we'll distribute it to the families. And so this Sunday is the last Sunday to take these cards, so I encourage you to go and to grab the angel tree cards. Take your Bibles with me, if you would, and turn to the Gospel of Luke. As we move into the Christmas season, like I, I want to share some conviction of my own heart. You know, I remember when I was going into the ministry, I, I, I would think to myself, and I'd have these conversations with my father, who's been a pastor now for over 40 years, and I said, you know, well, Christmas and Easter, those are easy, right? I mean, Christmas and Easter, those are, those are the times that you don't have to really struggle with, okay, what's the subject or what's the text, right? I mean, we know the story of Christmas and Easter. And what I've learned in my time in the ministry is that that's not always a good thing. That I've felt myself, and I'm going to share some personal conviction here even this week, as I began to think about Christmas, I think about the parties, and I think about all the, the things that come with it. Like, the Lord just really convicted my heart. Because I started thinking to myself, you know, okay, what's a way, what's an angle we can come at this to see something different in the Christmas season? Like, what's a, what's a clever way that we can come from this side or that side? And I just felt the Lord saying, you know what, don't miss the story. You know, don't miss the simple truth of what Christmas is about and how easy that is, right? I mean, we get caught up in things, and even in the church and even in the story of the Gospels of Christmas, like we can sometimes miss it because we've heard it so many times. You know, we grew up in it. Let me ask, how many of you grew up in the church? Raise your hand. How many of you grew up hearing the stories of the virgin birth, hearing the stories of the manger, hearing the stories of Bethlehem and no room in the end? We saw the plays. We sing the songs. And I think sometimes when we come to the Christmas season, we're kind of numb about it. And we miss how extraordinary this truly is. And so this is the challenge that I'm going to give to you. It's the same challenge I feel like the Lord has given to me over these next four weeks. It's to take a fresh look at the Christmas story. To approach Luke chapter 1 and 2 as if we have never heard the story ever before. You know, our mission statement is what? Living every day captivated and changed by Jesus. So what does that mean when it pertains to the Christmas story? What's so captivating about the Christmas story? I don't want you to miss that. How does it change us? I don't want you to miss that. And so as we go through this Christmas story over these next four weeks, we're just going to be in the book of Luke. And I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't know where we're going to go. Is that cool? You guys cool with that? You got to be. I don't know where we're going to go. You know, sometimes at Christmas you have this like series of uh, the, the, the gifts of Christmas or the characters of Christmas or the, you know, I've done the genealogy of the Old Testament of Jesus of, of Christmas. Well, this is what we're going to do this year. We're just going to tell the Christmas story. Amen. We're just going to tell the story. We're going to go to Luke 1 and 2, and this is my challenge to you this week and over the next four weeks, is to just simply spend time in this story to see how extraordinary truly the Christmas story is and to not miss it in the midst of our traditions and our chaos and our stress, to not miss truly how remarkable this is, what God has done for us. It reminds me of a story. The guy was going house to house, and he was trying to make a little bit extra money to buy some Christmas gifts. And so he knocked on a lady's house, and she came to the door. He said, ma'am, I'm just looking to do some odd jobs. I can, I can do a lot of different things. Do you have any needs? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, I, I need someone to paint my porch in the back. She said, would you be willing to do that? He said, sure. He said, I can paint. I'm a good painter. She said, all right, all the paints in the garage, go help yourself. So about four hours went by. Five hours comes out. She, he comes back to the door, and she sees that he's been working because he's got paint all over him. He said, ma'am, I finished. She paid him. And so as he's walking away, he says, just so you know, that's not a Porsche, it's a Mercedes. All right, so Luke chapter 1. And, right? Not bad. 
porch, porch, not bad. All right, Luke chapter 1 and 2. That's better than the 8.30. Somebody screamed out three and a half at the 8 o'clock service this morning. So take your Bibles. I'm asking you to stand with me in reverence to reading God's Word. What I want you to see this morning is the ordinary and the extraordinary. This is what I want you to see. The ordinary and the extraordinary. What I want you to see for four weeks is a fresh look at the Christmas story, captivated and changed by the Christmas story. The first five words of Luke chapter 2 says, and it came to pass. What came to pass? And what does that mean for me and my life today? We want to answer that question. So what I want you to see today, there are two things that jumped out at me as I tried to come at this story just with a fresh outlook and a fresh perspective. And what jumped out at me, again, are the ordinary characters of the story, that God did extraordinary things. We see Zacharias here, the priest, the father of John the Baptist, of how Gabriel appears to him. So let's just read this, if you would, and then we're going to work our way into chapter 2 and kind of look at the first five verses because the city of Nazareth is also something that has truly jumped out at me. But let's read these verses. Luke chapter 2, I think on the screen I've got verses 12 through 20, but I want to back up a little bit further than that. Okay, let's back up to 8, and then we'll catch up with the screen when we get to verse 12. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Did I say one? We'll get to two. Did I say two? Luke one and two, okay? Luke one and two. We're going to be in Luke one and two over these next two weeks. But Luke one now. And then we'll get to two. Luke chapter one, I'm sorry. Not three. All right, Luke chapter one, beginning in verse eight. So it was that while he was serving as a priest, Zacharias, before God in order of the division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went to the temple of the Lord. But you have to be careful with Luke, is he'll just make a sentence and you just read it and it's like, oh, that's cool. But there's something that's just amazing in that one sentence. This was a once in a lifetime opportunity for Zacharias to serve in this way. And look at what happens. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And here we catch up with this, verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Of course it did. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great. In the sight of the Lord, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, him, Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years." Let's come back to that for a moment. You should probably know that because there's an angel standing in front of you. It says this, verse 19. Then angel answered and said to him, Dude, do you not realize who I am? I am Gabriel. Like, I have this picture that if Gabriel had a mic, he would just drop it right there. Like, is that weird? I'm Gabriel. Recognize? Like, I don't know if that happened. That's what I read. So what happens here? The angel said to him, Recognize, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad times. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak and that the things that have taken place, because you did not believe my words, which were filled in their own time. So we're gonna, we got a lot to work through over these next four weeks, but I'm excited to see where the Lord takes us. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we truly are captivated by the story. So allow us, Lord, to have a fresh outlook of, of, of our personal experience with Christmas. Understanding, Lord, that we are being pulled in so many different directions when it comes to this celebration. So, Lord, allow us as the church to stay fixed upon you, to be centered upon what this message is truly about, the good news of the gospel, that a Savior intervened, that a Savior came into our time and space, lived as a human being, fully God, fully man, and he died upon a cross for our sins. Lord, may we not miss the cross in the story of Christmas, that, yes, it is a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem, that that baby is our Savior who grew in wisdom and knowledge and who lived a perfect life and died as a substitute for our sins. Lord, may we not miss that in this Christmas season, to be captivated by your work, but to be changed by it. And so, Lord, this morning, allow us to have a fresh perspective of the story of Christmas. We ask it, we pray it, and it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. 
Like it is, I, I go back to my Precious Moments Bible. Like I have all these images in my head when I read a passage of Scripture. And it's weird, they all look like those characters from the Precious Moments. Like that's what I envision. Like that's why I envision Zacharias looking like, but that's weird. So he's there in the temple and the angel appears. Now you got to understand, I mean, Luke just makes a statement and you can just kind of pass over it. What's amazing about that is even just the, the, the person of Luke, there's great mystery there. We know that he was a physician. We know that he was a historian. We know that he is centered upon speaking truth, right? I mean, at the beginning of this letter, he says, these are not fables. These are not fairy tales. These things happen. This is an historical account of what took place in the birth of our Savior. And what's amazing about that is you go through and you study the New Testament, Luke is responsible for really one-third of the New Testament. You think about that, right? I mean, 52 chapters of Scripture, if I'm not mistaken. 24 chapters in the book of Luke, 28 chapters in the book of Acts. So Luke and Paul are responsible for two-thirds of the writings of the New Testament. Not one time in his two letters does Luke identify himself as the author. Many historians find that interesting, of such humility of this man. But speaking truth of what took place. And so these next two weeks, we're just going to look at Luke chapter 1 and 2. And what I want you to see is the ordinary and the extraordinary. The Bible describes Zacharias as a certain priest. Don't think about that. He was just one of many how the Bible describes. It doesn't describe him as a holy or righteous. It does say that he was blameless in the sight of God, that he was faithful in the sight of God. But there was nothing special about this man. But that God used the ordinary to accomplish the extraordinary. That there we see an angel, Gabriel, appear to him and he says to him, how can I know this? Because my wife and I are old, we cannot bear children. And again, I have that picture of Gabriel saying, dude, do you not realize who I am? And because of your unfaithfulness, you will be mute until the day that he is born. You follow Luke chapter 1, right? We know in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and we'll probably come back to this over these next four weeks, that great encounter of Gabriel encountering Mary and Mary ultimately saying, may your will be done in my life. You see that beautiful song of Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 down to verse 56. Spend some time with this over these next four weeks. Spend some time with Luke 1 and 2. We see the birth of John the Baptist beginning in verse 57. We see the prophecy of Zacharias in Luke 1, 67, all the way through the end of the chapter. And then you come to Luke chapter 2 and you find these five words, and it came to pass. I love that. And it came to pass. Paul describes it in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, to understand how extraordinary this is, it had been 400 years since people had heard the voice of God. There had been silence for God's people. But for such a time as this, and it came to pass that in the sovereignty of God, God began to use ordinary human beings like you and I to accomplish an extraordinary thing. The greatest miracle in the history of the world. Think about that. The greatest miracle in the history of the world. The greatest miracle is the incarnation of Christ. That God would become man. And we sometimes go through the season, and again, we just kind of go through it. We know the story. We've read the story. We've seen the story in many different outlets and how easy it is to truly miss how remarkable this is that God came into his own creation, not born of sin, but conceived in the righteousness of the Lord. Think about that. Never sinned in his life. In the fullness of time, and it came to pass. And what you find in the Christmas story is anytime Jesus encounters something, it changes things. If it's an individual, it changes the individual. If it's a town, it changes the town. Let me show you something. Go to Luke chapter 2 and let's look at the verse 4 verses. Zechariah stood out to me as I took this new perspective of Luke 1 and 2, but also just even the city of Nazareth. Think about this. We see that identified with Jesus so many times in Scripture. Let's not miss this. You go back even to verse 26 of chapter 1, and we know that in the announcement of Gabriel to Mary, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent by God to the Sea of Galilee, named Nazareth. Now let's go to the first four verses of chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. I want you to see this. God works in the details of our lives. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of, say it with me, out of the city of Nazareth. And we're going to talk about that. Into Judea 
the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So we see the picture that the Bible is painting, right? Luke tells us that shortly after she became pregnant, Mary and Joseph, they go to Bethlehem to register for the Roman census. After the birth of Christ, King Herod, as you know the story, heard about this new king born in Bethlehem, and he sought to kill him. And so being warned in a dream, Joseph and Mary, what did they do? They flee to Egypt, where they live for the next couple of years until King Herod died. Many believe that when they returned to Nazareth, Jesus was probably four, five years old. But even the city of Nazareth, I was reading some commentators about specifically the city of Nazareth. Listen to how it's described. An insignificant backwater town. How many people are from an insignificant backwater town? Can I get an amen? Amen. God can use those people from insignificant backwater towns. I had one stoplight in a, in a Texaco, and that was the hangout of the city back in my hood. Anyway, Nazareth, most scholars, they describe it as this, an unimpressive town hidden away in the mountains of Galilee, one of many, right, one of many 200 little towns in that area. Even if you go to the website of, of Nazareth itself, you'll find these words, a small, insignificant agricultural village in the time of Jesus. You say, what does all this have to do with anything? That when Jesus encounters something, it changes things. Their value, their worth. What's interesting about this, again, the ordinary, an ordinary town, a backwater town, Nazareth. But as you go through and you study God's word, we know that, it, yes, it was the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah had already spoke those words. But ultimately, what do you find? You find the city always attached to Jesus. If you do a word search of Nazareth, 30 times you'll find it in the New Testament. And 30 times, guess what you will find directly associated with the city of Nazareth? You find the name of Jesus. What does that mean? The ordinary to the extraordinary. And even the city of Nazareth. Talk about value, talk about worth, talk about identity. Listen to this. Matthew quotes it in chapter 2, verse 19. He gives us this prophecy. He says this, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning of Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Listen to what it says. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. 700 years earlier, you go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. You'll find this verse right here. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. That word is critical. A branch shall grow out of his roots. If you go back to the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for branch is netzer. It is the root word of Nazareth, our Nazarene. So what is Matthew saying? Matthew's telling us that in order for Jesus to fulfill the prophecy that said that he would be called the branch, he had to come from the city of Nazareth, the sovereignty of God and the details of the story. I mean, many of you have heard this before. You know, many believe that there were over 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by Christ. 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. What's the chances of that? I've done this before, and I'm sure you've seen it. The chances of just fulfilling eight Old Testament prophecies is this number. One in ten to the 17th power. That's one in ten with 17 zeros. Do you remember the Mega Millions a couple weeks ago? I'm not going to have you raise your hand because some of you got some cards. But do you remember the Mega Millions? Like, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that many zeros. Well, think about this. The chances of Jesus just fulfilling 50 of the 300, just 50 of the 300, just 15% of the prophecies of the Old Testament is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That's 1 in 10 to 157 zeros. I tried to put it on the screen. I couldn't even fit it because of all the zeros. You say, what are you saying? What I'm saying is every single prophecy of Scripture that God works in the details of the story. He takes the ordinary and he makes it extraordinary. Nazareth now identified with a Savior, its identity, its purpose, its worth. Why? Because Jesus encountered it. It's the story that you find play out all throughout these, pa these pages. That when Jesus encounters an individual, when the story of the Lord comes to an individual's life, there is a moment of crisis and we see ourselves in this, right? We see the Lord leading and we come to a place where we're standing at a crossroads. 
like each one of these individuals, the ordinary people from backwater towns, that God says, I desire to do a work in you. I desire to use you. I desire to fulfill my purpose and ultimately glorify my name in your life. But for every one of us, it plays out, right? For every one of us, we're Zacharias who are standing before the Lord going, how can this be? We're Mary standing before the Lord going, how can this be? It doesn't make sense in my mind. I know you're leading and I know the enemy is downplaying, but I have fear, right? Have you ever been there? If you've ever been there, say amen. Amen? If you didn't say amen, you just lied. We all have fear in our lives. And so what you find in the story is that when God intervenes, it comes to a point of a crisis of faith. But I love how Nazareth is identified with Jesus. Every time you find it. When he's introduced in John 1, 45, it says these words, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. When Jesus was casting out demons in Luke 4, 34, the demon says this, Go away, what do you want with us? Jesus of Nazareth. When Peter was arrested, do you remember that? He denied Christ three times. The lady comes to Peter and says, You are also with that Nazarene, Jesus. In John 19, 19, when Jesus is crucified, Pilate orders, if you remember the sign to go above his head that says, says what? Jesus of Nazareth. Even when he rose from the grave, you go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 6, the Bible says, the angels appeared to the ladies there at the tomb and said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Angels, demons, enemies, friends, even Christ himself identified as Jesus of Nazareth. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Why didn't you say Jesus of Galilee? I mean, that's the region that, you know, he was from, or Jesus of Capernaum. That's where he did most of his ministry, or even, it sounds more luxurious to say Jesus of Israel. But it doesn't. It says Jesus of Nazareth. The ordinary for the extraordinary. You think about it, every detail of this story, right? I mean, everything about Jesus' birth was plain, was simple. When Jesus was born, he was born in a barn. There was no cute bassinet, no warm, elegant room, no room service, no servants. He was born in the feeding trough of a barn. And when he was born, who did the angels make the first announcement to? It wasn't to kings. It wasn't to priests. It wasn't to prophets. It wasn't to politicians. The angels came to who? The shepherds. The ordinary for the extraordinary. And so my prayer for you, my prayer for me is as we go through this Christmas story, spend time in Luke 1 and 2 and approach it like you've never approached it before. Approach it as if this is the first time you have heard this story and allow the captivation to take place, that God would intervene, that God would come into the chaos of this world, that he would come to me, that he would come for me, that he would pursue me, walk and live as a human being, experience the same emotions, experience the same things that I experience without sin. But I know I have a high priest that identifies. Can I get an amen? Amen? I know when I struggle that I call upon a Savior who understands. Can I get an amen? Amen? I know that when I'm walking through the storms of life that I have a Savior who too has walked through these steps. And so the Bible says, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, the sovereignty of God. There are so many of you that are holding on to this statement right here. In the Christmas story, may you be encouraged, and it came to pass. What is it that you're waiting on for the Lord? And it came to pass. Maybe it's today. Maybe it's tomorrow that you too can say, and it came to pass. The promises of God have played out in my life. I haven't seen them. I haven't felt them. I trust them, but it came to pass. And what a promise that God doesn't miss that. There's some of you here today where the enemy is questioning the work of God in your life. He's sovereign. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. And the backdrop In the backdrop of a a side town, a hill valley, God did his greatest work. I think about David's word in Psalm 144, verse 3. He says this, O Lord, what is man that you care for him? The son of man that you would think of him. God says, you know what I think of you? I'm going to show you. I'm going to present to you the most precious thing that can be presented, my son. As we go through this story, just don't miss that over these next four weeks. In all of your activities, in all of your schedules, 
Don't miss the extraordinary. The incarnation of God. That Christ would come as a baby. Listen to these words. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen what? The foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. You are in Christ Jesus who became for us from God in righteousness, sanctification, redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That in Christ there is what? There is righteousness. There is sanctification. There is redemption. That in the Christmas story, we encounter a God who intervened. We encounter a God who came into the chaos of this world. And we serve a God who works works in the details of our lives. You don't miss that. As you look at this story, don't miss that. Don't miss the small little details. And you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about, where the Lord is stirring, the Lord is stirring, and you're, you're doing the Heisman pose. You know what I'm talking about, guys? You know what I'm talking about? And ladies, y'all watch fo- football. You know what I'm talking about? The, the Heisman pose, where you're like, no, 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 that's uncomfortable. No, 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 I, 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 this is my routine. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope. there's fear involved, right? We see it play out in every one of these stories. And in every one of these stories, what do you find? Ordinary men and women like you and I that encounter an extraordinary God. And a God who comes and says, hey, I want to do a work. I want to do something that you can't even imagine for my glory and for my honor. But we stand at a crossroads of submission. And you see it play out in every one of, in every one of these stories. The simple the ordinary, but accomplishing the extraordinary. Take your Bibles. I want you to see a verse, if you would. Romans chapter 5. Go there if you would. And I believe, man, found in just these couple of verses, you find truly the meaning of all of this. The hope of Christmas. And I challenge you as I have been challenged as we go through these next four weeks. To keep this in the forefront. To let this be upon our hearts and our minds consistently. In the stress of all that's in front of us. To not miss the main thing. Look at this verse. Romans 5 verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom also we have access by faith. Don't miss that. Into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. There's hope in our struggles, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Five verses of Scripture that really explains the main thing. What is the main thing? That you and I, as sinful men and women, we stand against God. We stand against his holiness and his righteousness because of our sins. Your greatest problem, my greatest problem is our sins before a holy God. But Paul says, but God intervened in the fullness of time and it came to pass that a Savior was born. And for those who call upon the name of the Savior, what does it say? They are justified not by a religion, not by an ordinance, not by a ceremony. They are justified by faith through Jesus Christ. And in faith in Jesus Christ, what do you have? You have peace. You have peace with God. And because you're at peace with God, you have the peace of God. You now stand in the righteousness of Christ. You now stand in the blamelessness of Christ. You now stand in the perfection of Christ. And that hope leads to what? Access to the throne of God. Don't miss the story of Christmas. That because of Christ, every single day of my life, every moment, every second, I have direct access to the throne of God. 
access to the throne of God. That even in my struggles, Paul says, there's hope knowing that in my tribulations there's perseverance. And in that perseverance there's character. And in that character it even leads to more hope. To know that, hey Lord, this isn't random. This isn't a coincidence. Just as I see your sovereignty in the story of Christmas, I see and trust your sovereignty in my life. These individuals experienced chaos, but you brought them to a place of a crisis of faith. When I find myself there, may I trust you. I mean, it's hope because of peace. It's hope because of the access we have. But look at that last verse of verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Don't miss that. That what do we celebrate at Christmas, man? Yes, we celebrate a baby born in a manger. Yes, we celebrate that, but we celebrate what it led to. That God intervened and it came to pass. That his Savior, his Son, came to this world. And he died upon a cross for our sins. And for those who turn from their sins and call upon a Savior, what does it say? Man, you have been justified, paid in full before a holy God. And because of that justification, there's sanctification. Hope, knowing that he's faithful to complete the work he's begun in me. He's not going to leave me here. What he's led me to, he's going to lead me through. What has he led you to this morning? The enemy's telling you he ain't going to lead you through it. But what he's led me to, he's going to lead me through. There's hope in that. And it's the love of God that's been poured out in my heart. And his Holy Spirit dwells. And he leads and he comforts. What do you find? The ordinary to the extraordinary. And my challenge to you over these next four weeks is the challenge that God has given me to not just go through the motions of this, to spend some time with history, right? And to get into the details of truly the most extraordinary event in the history of the world. That God would become a man for me That Christ would enter into the place that he created for me. That Christ would take my failures and my faults for me. That he would willingly die upon a cross for my sins. That's the story of Christmas. With every head bowed and every eye closed. What is it this morning that you're waiting on the Lord for? And it came to pass. And it came to pass. Maybe that is your prayer. He said, Lord, as I'm going through this Christmas season, Lord, it's going to be hard. And I recognize that. For many who are entering into this season, this is a hard season. Maybe you've lost someone you love. Maybe you're going through a storm like never before, but it's a hard season. And just as we speak of God's love and God's comfort and God's grace, we know that we have an enemy that opposes So my prayer of these next four weeks is that we would see this story from a fresh outlook that we truly would be captivated by God intervening into our creation, living as a man to die on the cross. Maybe some of you and you're at a crisis of faith right now. There may not be an angel standing in front of you, but you know the stirring of the Lord. You know it, you feel it, and the enemy's downplaying. And you stand there at a crossroads. So the question will be, how does it play out in your life? Like these characters, can you say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I submit to it. I don't want to miss it. That you would choose me to do a work. So my question also this morning is just simply, man, do you have this hope? Bottom line, do you have this hope in you? That you have truly been justified by your faith in Christ. It's not a coincidence that you're here today. So here's this moment of crisis right here. What do we do with it? What is God telling you to do? I'm going to invite you to stand, if you would, at this time as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look at the Christmas story, Lord, we, we, we do, we see ourselves. Lord, we see our sins. We see our need to be rescued. And you did that for us. In the fullness of time, and it came to pass when a Savior who was promised from years ago came and fulfilled every prophecy proven that he was 
who he said he was. And so, Lord, as we walk through this story, may we see ourselves, but, Lord, may we truly be captivated by your love for us. That you came for us. That you sought us. So, Lord, in the midst of all that's going to be going on, may we stay close to the cross. May we stay close to the cross. As we see this baby in a manger, may we see the provision, the justification, the one who came and died for us. May you be glorified in all the things that we do. May the name of Jesus be lifted high. We pray it, we ask it, we praise it, and all God's people say.